only look this way. <laughs> okay, so we are live, alhamdulillah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ala amma ba'd. So uh, I would like to welcome everyone to our virtual Friday night halaqa. Um, and uh, today, actually tonight, we are going to discuss a very important topic. And that is pros and cons of Islamic school versus public school versus homeschooling. And um, in, in the recent times, um, I have seen so many people debating in my own family, in my community, in the masajid. Uh, people arguing that one is better or other. And I'm pretty sure our panelists have heard the same argument over and over again. Uh, so instead of just discussing this and drinking chai without any fruit, let's go to professional people who are educators in our community for a long time. And let's discuss with them uh, that what is better, what, what is pros and cons of um, Islamic school versus public school versus homeschooling from a Muslim perspective. And uh, I'm, 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 we are glad to, to have us today, three of our esteemed panelists. I'll quickly introduce uh, one, we have Dr. Noor Ali. She is a principal of Al Hamra Academy in Shrewsbury. And uh, she had been a teacher in this community for 15 years in elementary and middle school. And Sister Noor has completed her doctorate in education in curriculum, teaching, learning, and leadership from Northeastern University. Um, Dr. Ali is uh, an assistant professor also in Worcester State University in a graduate education program. Mashallah, very versatile personality. I welcome Dr. Noor Ali to, in today's program. Thank you. Uh, welcome. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, Dr. Nadim Sekander. Um, we know each other for last almost five years. Uh, he's principal of Al Huda Academy uh, in uh, Worcester. He is also a chaplain in University of Western New England. Um, his um, education is also a doctorate of education in American International College from Springfield, Massachusetts. And he has conducted various workshops about youth counseling and curriculum, curriculum planning and development. So we'd like to welcome also Brother Nadim Sekander. Assalamualaikum. Thank you. Salam alaikum. Salam. And then we have Mr. Hafsa Dandia, who have a very diverse portfolio because uh, she have been a mother for home she who did homeschooling, then teacher at Islamic school, then teacher at public school. I'll just read it quickly. Uh, that she have done masters in education and elementary education, and Subhanallah, she has been teacher for 24 years. Am I reading it correctly, Sister Rosa? Mashallah. Uh, this is my 24th. Mashallah. <laughs> if this would have been a masjid Friday night halakha instead of online, I would have said takbir. <laughs> but I don't want my neighbors to call police, right? <laughs> okay. Then have it, uh, she have taught uh, from kindergarten to sixth grade, except for the first grade. She have been a uh, teacher in both the Islamic schools, Al Hamra and Al Huda, for seven years. For seventeen years, she um, is part of Worcester Public Schools. She's currently in these in her sixth year as an instructional coach, parent to four children. And um, she also supported her son via homeschooling for three complete years while he completed his hivs. Uh, and mashallah, his son leads salah in our masjid also, mashallah. Um, so now, um, let's just start with uh, uh, Dr. Noor and we will go with the sequence. I will ask Dr. Noor, then Dr. Nadim, and then Sister Afsa. Uh, without wasting any time, let, let, let me just come to the topic. Uh, what do you think are the pros and cons of Islamic school versus public school versus home school? Yes, Dr. Noor. So before I answer that question, I just want to say that um, Hafsa is a dissertation topic and she could actually have been the only panelist on this because she's got experience in all, all the different scenarios. Um, so I, I really don't know why uh, Nadeem and I are here. <laughs> um, having that's said right. that, I do have a little bit of, uh, and, and maybe that's because... Um, language is, is big for me and choice of words um, is, 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 is a big thing for me. So, you know, I, I have a slight problem with the topic um, because anytime we place um, verses between different things, we're essentially looking at them as 
competitors, um, which is something that I disagree with entirely because I think that um, each of the models of education, um, whether it is Muslim schooling gone right or gone wrong, uh, or homeschooling gone right or gone wrong, or public schooling gone right or gone wrong. I mean, there, there are so many environmental factors that go within making any model of education a model of education that um, I don't necessarily see them as competitors um, to each other. And they're more like, um, they're more like, um, different choices or flavors that are offered to us um, and whatever suits your palate uh, and whatever meets your needs best um, is what you end up going for. And it may be that, uh, and Hafsa is a great example again of this, I'm sorry I'm picking on you Hafsa, of uh, someone who has uh, these experiences in, um, in each of those scenarios, right? And I'm sure that in her life, uh, as is the case for many other people, um, you know, uh, there's times when, when things work out and there's times when you want to try something else. Um, so I don't necessarily see them as competitors. Um, having said that, yeah, there's, there are definitely different flavors to it. Uh, Muslim education or Muslim schooling will definitely have a big environmental factor to it, uh, where it is more often than not community centered um, and will bring practices of faith or spirituality center um, and will kind of veer away from um, non-talk of religion or uh, a secular, uh, you know, um, uh, really philosophy to it. Um, having said that, that doesn't mean that Muslim schooling seeks to be disconnected um, to the environment that it is in. Um, if it's done right. Um, and then of course, homeschooling offers a very different flavor to it, you know, where parents are uh, taking charge of the educational development of their of their children um, based on their needs, their you know, pacing, all of those things, um, you know, can really be catered uh, very specifically to the children that are present there. And then of course, public schooling is public schooling, varies uh, from states and towns and cities uh, to neighborhoods um, and everything in between. So that's my quick spiel on that. That's awesome, mashallah. Uh, yes, Dr. Nadeem. So inshallah, I think I, think I, I would, uh, uh, what uh, Sister Noor had mentioned about uh, how we are all actually serving the needs of community. And I think it is important to um, note here is that it's really not um, uh, public versus uh, more so private versus homeschool. It's more uh, so of what uh, who your community's needs. So if 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 for example, you know the 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 faith is important or the culture or the norms at home are important, and you think that uh, your child is better fit in an Islamic school, because I think what you have to really look at it is that what is the mission? What exactly is the end product you're looking at? So if you think, I mean, uh, I can speak to this in terms of my personal experience, having to have four kids who've been through Islamic school, end up going in a, in a, in a, a graduated from Islamic school, then moved in. Some of them, obviously, uh, they couldn't go to Islamic so school for some, uh, some financial reasons, but they end up attending public school. And you can clearly see uh, four of them actually now moving into colleges and doing that. So that kind of give you the uh, pretty much the, overall picture of the differences that I see in my children. Uh, so that that sort of, you know, it, it actually taught me that, you know, uh, where do our kids belong? Like what is important to them? Is faith really matter to me? You know, is, you know, that's the, that is that my focus? Is, is values matter to me? Is, uh, is for example, you know, uh, what we do as a culture, does that matter to, to, to us? Then I think you have to really look at the end product you're looking at and how you want to have your child get education, of course, Islamic as well as um, the, the secular education. And how do you want to have that child being, uh, you know, how, how do you want your child to grow in a culture where he could get best, best of both worlds? So... I think that's how I, I view it, uh, you know, Islamic schools and, and private school. I don't have any experience in terms of homeschooling, but I'm sure that, you know, Sister Hafsa can speak to some, some of that. That's awesome. Yes, Sister Hafsa, both of the our panelists are looking towards you for homeschooling. So, yes, please. So, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, Sister Noor and Brother Nadim both very articulately explained kind of the idea of um, 
like a buffet of choices. Um, but I think the primary purpose of any discussion like this is what is your priority? What is it that you're looking for your children? And, you know, as Muslims, I think identity is a very big part of that conversation. Who are we as Muslims? How do we function as Muslims? How, what is our, you know, how is our love of Allah the guiding factor in what we do? And that can be, you know, that's something that primarily starts in the home. And then you have these three scenarios in which you can have a situation where that is encouraged. Um, and we, you know, it comes down to, is that the, the first and foremost priority? So, I mean, speaking to kind of like the pros and cons, you know, you have uh, the need, the desire to build that identity, to the desire to build that um, feeling of belonging that comes with being around other people that understand, as we said, culture, your dean, your belief system, and not having to explain those things, especially when they're young, um, is a huge confidence builder. It's a huge kind of, this is who I am and I'm solid in who I am. So I think that's really where it comes to. So if a parent is, you know, homeschooling or sending their child to Islamic school, it's, it, you know, that's kind of taken care of in that sense. If they are in public school, then there has to be a little bit of a counterbalance that happens because I work in public schools and I love my students, you know, but my morals don't necessarily match the morals of my coworkers or um, the other, the students' parents for that matter. So, you know, that kind, that really is where you have to be thinking about, and I don't like the idea of verses, but you know, when we're thinking about the identities of our children and their faith, that is something that we have to think about. Awesome, mashallah. Um, now, I just want to ask you a counter question to three of you. Let's start with Sister Noor. Um, uh, especially you and uh, Dr. Nadim uh, focused on faith and Islam and religion. Um, so let's say uh, if we are going to say that uh, we're going to preserve the faith of our kids, if we are sending them to Islamic school more because of the values and environment. Uh, but there are, first of all, I know that in Muslim community, you will, have, you will find a wide variety of flavors from liberal to conservative who will accuse Islamic school themselves of uh, being either too liberal or too conservative, that why your, why your school Al-Hamra or Al-Huda does not have any Hifs program or Alim program or Mufti program or Sheikh or whatever. Um, and then if you will have that, then there are people who will accuse you that, no, 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 this is just a madrasa type of thing. We want to teach academics, higher secular education in Islamic values. We don't want to make them, um, uh, all of them scholars. We need engineers, we need doctors. So one thing is that when you define we want to preserve faith, uh, what is the priority of your schools? That's first. And second, even some of personal experience I have, alhamdulillah, most of the kids graduated from both these schools. And generally, I was imam in New Jersey in Connecticut. Uh, so I saw that Islamic school kids have a unique personality. Uh, but not all of them. Some of them will going to, uh, some of them will become non-practicing Muslim. Um, and then some of them have scary stories. Um, why this happened? Why, why do you think when your focus and your attention is to, to preserve the faith, um, why this happened? So again, let's start with Dr. Noor. I think there's a couple of parts to this. Um, I think I'll start with uh, uh, maybe the first part, which is, you know, how do Muslim schools seek to preserve uh, faith or work towards faith um, in their environments. And I think that the question is probably, the answer is probably not going to be a generic one because I think every school does this a little bit differently um, depending on um, the school's philosophy, um, you know, the history of the school, even the location of the school and all of everything in between. Um, in my case, for instance, at our school, um, you know, you have the religious sciences or you have Arabic, you have religion, you have Quran, um, you have all of those things that are, uh, that you can pocket um, faith in, but it's really important to um, unpocket it as well and to make sure that you're seeing that conversation uh, that's centered around faith-based identity occur in the other classes as well. Right. So whether it's English language arts or science and all of those things, um, you have that element of faith 
um, that permeates all the different um, areas that are there, the different conversations, the, the social culture of a place, and you know all of those things um, are really important. The second part of the question is, why is it that if faith-based schools um, have faith at center, all students who graduate from there are not going to have um, faith that we would want them to have. I'm trying to say this as, as, as best as I can uh, without generalizing the statement. Um, so it's, it's, I think you can apply the same premise that you can apply to any two children in any one family. Um, no two children are alike. Anyone who has two kids uh, or has worked with any two children will know that um, they are most probably going to be poles apart. Um, in, in religious conversations, we're always given the reference of Nuh alayhi salam, you know, uh, who I'm sure was a wonderful example of a father who was faith practicing, um, but the, you know, his son was not. Um, there's always going to be many different environmental factors. And I think we also need to ch see children not as extensions of ourselves, but to see children as people themselves um, and as independent human beings um, that have their own series of experiences and events that are going to occur um, that will shape them. Um, and sometimes they, uh, you know, they are going to experiment with different things. And at other times, uh, you know, hopefully they're going to be drawn back to it. So I think that the circumstances is not unique to Muslim schools. Uh, it is something that applies to human beings and human nature in general um, that you'd really see anywhere. Um, and I think that um, a, a large part um, is also played um, by parents. Um, and, and, I, and, and I don't want to undermine the value um, that parenting plays um, in whatever type of schooling the kids are going to. So despite the fact that um, your child is going to a Muslim school or your child is going to a public school, because it's very possible that there is a family that has faith at center, right? But cannot afford to send their child to a Muslim school for whatever reason. It could be a social reason, an economic reason, a geographical reason or whatever. So it doesn't mean that faith is not the center of their lives. It is very much the center of their lives, but the choice is not available to them. So, you know, they're going to try and do their best. Uh, of course, the child is going to be for X number of hours away from them. I always tell our parents, your kids are with us for more waking hours than they are with you. Right. <laughs> um, so it's really important. And so like almost saying we know them better. Uh, <laughs> um, but I think that that's really important to see that, you know, the, there's a huge role that parenting plays in this as well. Uh, Dr. Noor, uh, yes, uh, Dr. Nadeem, what do you think? Uh, you are on mute, Dr. Nadeem. You are on mute, Dr. Nadeem. Um, can you unmute yourself? Oh, sorry. Yes, sorry. we can hear you now. I, I, I actually didn't mute myself, so I think it was some admin access has the power to do that. Um, so I think uh, Sister Noor, I think put it together really nice. Um, that, but I'll just uh, I'll just chip into some of those uh, questions that you put out. For example, you know what each school have uh, uh, talking about mission, visions, and values, right? So, you know, I've been a part of the the school system at least for some independent, some uh, private, some public. Um, you know what really drives your population? You know what is it what what is it that you're there for you know if if better muslim better citizen is the mission of al huda are we producing those people you know we need to really uh, qualitatively analyze this are we getting that kind of population and alhamdulillah i've seen you know this is my fourth year with with al huda academy and i've seen some wonderful kids coming out and of course i mean i'll just jump on to the other part of the question which is you find kids being non practicing but I really think um, as a community, we need to come together to, to build better platforms for our children. I mean, I'm very focused with children, by the way. Uh, you know, I, I'll give you an example. In the morning when I open doors for children, it's not to please parents. I have a lesson when I do things that is that, you know, they, they deserve that respect. So when they come out and they, you give them salam is is a prophetic way of reaching out. So for me, what we do is we have we have a mission, we have value, and we have a vision. 
And the vision is like, you know, you grow, you enrich, and you lead. And I think as a Muslim community, this should be embedded in everything that we do. We should do it with the utmost perfection. Why? Because I think we're out there leading communities. We're out there reaching out to others. We're saying we are the example sent to, to we are the ummatul wasat we are in the we are the middle nation we are here to to show you the right way and honestly being a chaplain in a university i often talk to a higher education from all the way from freshman to the senior year and you know it just these are our discussions like you know how do we better ourselves so reaching out to our, our children and and giving them that mission and vision and and working with those mission vision values uh, is the key because i think you know just going back and forth with the with the public school system is just you you can't find that there you know i mean and again I, i'll i'll go back to what sister noor had mentioned a lot of people in my experience also wanting to bring their children into school i have a community here in west springfield they really are eager to reopen the school and they often ask you, like, you know, is there a way? And then, you know, this is a leadership leadership discussion where we need everybody to take part in it and, and continue to develop our school systems, Chad. Beautiful name. Jazakallah Khairan, Dr. Nadeem, uh, for a beautiful contribution. Yes, uh, Sister Hafsa. So speaking just holistically, love of Allah has to be the first priority whether it's homeschool, whether it's in our homes, whether it's in um, Islamic school, that is something you're not gonna get in public school because they have to be so away from it, you know, because, because they're all encompassing and accepting everyone. But that starts from day one, from the day you bring your child home, love of Allah, before we talk about fear of Allah. And I think that's really the priority that needs to be in our homes and that needs to be in our schools, and that needs to be in our daily conversations with our children. Now, having four, I call them all teenagers. My eldest is 21, so she's technically not a teenager, but really I have four teenagers, and they're crazy. They're just, <laughs> they're nuts, all of them. This is what they do. SubhanAllah, and you can hear it in my voice, that this is our life right now. Um, but shaitan is real, yeah. right? The temptations are real. The society that they live in does not value God. And if it values God, it does it in a way that doesn't require any sort of sacrifice from a human. And this is the life that they're living. This is the society that they're surrounded with. And I pray that we put that love of Allah early. We gave them that, you know, our love of Allah, we, we showed them that and we, we taught them and, and we forgave them and we just, you know, keep at it every single day so that if they do stray, they come back because not one of us has not messed up. Not one of us has made a bad, not made a bad decision. Every single one of us has made mistakes and every single one of us has done something that in the sight of Allah, you know, was not great. But yeah. alhamdulillah, you know, Allah brought us back. So we have to kind of keep reminding our, our children, especially when they're very young, Allah loves you so much, seek him, seek forgiveness. He's going to take you back. He's going to forgive you, of course. And we have to kind of, and then reminding them as they get older, okay, you know better than to make that mistake, right? But that that initial love of Allah has to be the priority. That's awesome. <laughs> mashallah. Uh, may Allah reward all of you. Uh, this conversation I'm really enjoying and learning, mashallah. Uh, now let's, let's move towards, uh, this is all nice stuff. Now let's move to loaded questions. Is it okay if I can ask loaded questions? Please. Let's, let's go with oh Okay, inshallah. We'll, 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 increase, <laughs> we'll increase our intensity slowly. So let's start with the uh, lower level. Um, my dear sister Hafsa, I just spotted your cat. <laughs> he, he's only one of two. I'm so sure that they're going to run across the keyboard. And I also have my headphones in so you don't hear the craziness in the background. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, alhamdulillah. Uh, so. Uh, Having said that love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can only be inculcated in Islamic schools, but this is also a reality that not all the kids, Muslim kids in this area will be enrolled to Islamic school for whatever reason. Um, now, what is the best option if they cannot enroll themselves in Islamic school for whatever reason? Uh, I guess three of us agree that Islamic school should be number one option uh, because of uh, the, the faith reasons. Uh, but let's say if, if that's not the case, should they go for public school or should they go for home school? If they are going with public school, how they can compensate the deficiency, which is being caused by not having love of Allah or Islamic environment. 
And if they are going for home school, what about lack of socializing? How can I compensate that? Uh, so let's just start with Dr. Noor again. Sure. So, okay, uh, I will request all these speakers um, not to take more than three minutes so that we can have one circle complete in nine minutes because we have many questions uh, today people are asking. So inshallah, we want to take those questions also. Sure, I'll talk to you. Um, so I, um, the, the question has certain parts. Um, one is is that if if somebody is not able to do Muslims is not able to come to a Muslim school and they're um, well first I'd say if they're in the area they should apply for financial assistance to both the schools and I'm sure they'd get in that's just a, that's just a side uh, insert um, if let's say it's that's one of the reason um, there but there are other reasons why they are not comfortable with Islamic school absolutely of, yeah yeah absolutely and. Having said that, um, where, whichever area you're in, you should always research the schools that your kids are going to. And just because a school is an Islamic school might not necessarily make it the best option for you. So I think really people need to do um, their due diligence. Um, having said that, you know, if you if if you are um, homeschooling your child um, instead of putting them um, somewhere else, I, I think that the socialization uh, bit or concern with homeschooling is a myth. Um, I don't necessarily think that socialization is an issue. Um, if homeschooling, if socializing is a big thing for you, which it kind of is for human beings who are growing. Um, there's many opportunities out there that allow you to socialize, whether it's um, town sports or many different organizations that have homeschool groups or have classes um, for students in the daytime or in you know later in the day uh, where they can certainly get their socialization piece in. Um, so, and, and I know like right here in Worcester too, there's many different options that are, uh, that are available to homeschooling families. So people wouldn't necessarily miss out on the socializing bit. Um, I think also socialization, when we talk of it as a con to homeschooling, is overrated. Um, socialization can be good or bad. Um, you know, there's not so great aspects of socialization as well. Um, and you kind of skirt those when you're homeschooling, which, you know, is, is definitely an advantage in that situation. Um, so that's just something to think about. And then if you're public school, uh, public schooling your child, um, then uh, you want to make sure that you're filling in for that uh, void of spirituality or s conversations that are uh, non-centered around faith, religion, spirituality in the school. And you're making that space uh, for your child to have those conversations, to speak about identity, uh, because a lot of their time is going to be spent either um, having their experience invalidated or feeling irrelevant to mainstream um, or perhaps pretending that they are not Muslim. Um, so there's, I mean, um, you, my dissertation was all about this. So there, there's many different issues that can occur in terms of identity work. Um, and I think that if your child is, is in public school, you just need to be cognizant of that, make that kind of space um, for that work around spirituality, faith, religion, um, identity to take place. Um, you could do it at home. You could do it in your group of friends and family. Family will become really, really critical. And that's not just your immediate family, but also your extended family. Um, and then, you know, if there's options for uh, programming around that, whether they're at the masjid or whatever, um, I think definitely engage in that if, if that's possible. Uh, that's great, mashallah, sister, and great response. Uh, yes, sir, brother Nadim, um, go ahead, please. Jazakallah khair. I think sister Noor again touched upon many of the um, uh, many of the uh, areas where, um, you know. So first of all, um, I think uh, the parents who are uh, are not interested or are interested, whatever the case may be, just for the sake of that we exist, they can visit us. It's really nothing wrong and uh, our doors are always open. At least come and learn what we are all about. You know, uh, you know, see what the mission and the vision and at least have, uh, for the sake of information, come into the school. Because often you hear, oh, we don't even know that you're here. Uh, you know, <laughs> but that's something, you know, I can't have a flag outside of the school waving and, and asking people to step in, but we always often make announcements. Number two is, um, you know, when, when we say, um, 
if if you happen to wanting to send your child to public, I I think uh, you really have to be careful about making that decision. I think uh, from the very mm -hmm. young age, I don't know how uh, people who have worked with the curriculum, uh, they probably know that they're gradually uh, bringing in uh, the curriculum that is uh, that is not really very appropriate for young people. I have seen those books from the KG up, uh, where's mom and mommy and dad and daddy are, are kind of the same gender. So I think that type of a programming is, is very critical critical for our children. You know, they are actually are very smart people. I wish I had more time that I, I can tell you, I can share you examples of how smart these people are. And I'm not, I'm not, uh, I, this is not uh, really uh, in, in any shape or form uh, exaggeration. They are very smart people. You know, you talk to a pre cake child and you tell him, hey, you're wearing a nice glasses. And he tells you, excuse me, these are not glasses. These are shades. So, you know, they really made you think about the conversation that they're having. So we need to be careful where they're going for schooling. Uh, but I, I would say that we need to make efforts together to make sure that we improve our schools. Or we uh, we find opportunities for these parents who are, and we really have to demystify this. Uh, and, and really, the, this has been 15 years. We really have to work and demystify that if somehow uh, parents cannot enroll for one reason or another in Islamic school, because we really are offering best of both worlds. Uh, I'm sure we have a lot of work on our hand, but we are on our toes every day, making sure that we deliver quality. Uh, last but not least, uh, uh, obviously, I think I wrote my own note, but I'm, I'm unable to read them. So I'll pass. <laughs> Oh, Jazakum Allah khairan to both of you. Sister Hafsa, I know this is your field, uh, homeschool and public school, but oh, will, you, will you give me two minutes to ask yes. them a counter question and then I will come to you. I will give you extra five minutes, inshallah, after that. Absolutely. You may Absolutely. have to repeat the Absolutely. question then. I want to just <laughs> ask both of you, the Sister Noor and Brother Nadeem. So you said that first they should try out in the area Islamic school, then they should make a decision. So apart from finances, um, which I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I know by both the kids go to both these schools, that uh, we are very good in uh, accommodating financial needs. Uh, but some other concerns which parents might have, I'm not saying this is right or wrong, and you can tell me, um, the concerns which parents will have, and this is generic to all the Islamic schools. I was in New Jersey, I heard this. I was in Connecticut, I heard this. And now I'm here, I'm hearing the same thing. And please correct me and correct the audience if they have this misunderstanding. Some people might have this perception that Islamic schools, no matter how great their performance is, but they have this perception is that they are not well equipped for teaching the modern day secular academic knowledge because of whatever reason, because of the lack of resources. Um, um, so how will you answer this in just 90 seconds, both of you, just you know what I'm rather than you're making this <laughs> okay. I'll give you 92 seconds then. Okay. <laughs> um, so, no, just take yeah. your time. No worries. Yeah, I would. I would definitely say that I, one can write a book on the myths of Islamic schooling, um, uh, because I think one of one of the greatest myths is people equate it to you know really being old school or. Um, just um, it's something that's going to give us an outdated curriculum or something that's not going to prepare our kids for the future or it's not going to prepare our kids for the world. So, I mean, I, there is probably 179 myths um, that are around this. Um, I think, uh, to Nadeem's point, I think it's really important for, for people to explore and to do their research uh, before they make a claim like this. I mean, I can say for Alhamdra, um, you know, uh, we were showcased nationally on our work in citizen science. That goes totally contrary to saying that it's, uh, you know, that it's not going to give you a curriculum that is going to be updated or that's going to be, um, you know, with the times really. Um, so I think it's really important for people to do their due diligence um, in researching. And I think the best way to do that is yes, um, set up a tour, set up a meeting, uh, even if it's a virtual tour now, uh, but talk to the people um, so you can really understand, you know, what um, the school leadership and what the program is looking like. Awesome, mashallah. Yes, Brother Nadeem, uh, before I can go to Sister Afsan. Yes, uh, you know, um, 
I'm not, uh, I'm not gonna say that we don't have work at our hand. We definitely have a lot of professional work to be done. Um, and of course it goes back to these professional developments and growing your staff to be equipped enough, you know, not to talk about high school right now, but professionally developing our staff, retaining our staff and really like enriching them. And I'm honestly saying it out of my heart that we truly want our professionally uh, delivered instructions to be state of the art. <laughs> We believe in the quality of education for our children. This is parents have, I truly believe the parents have entrusted their children with us and they have dreams with these children. So this is not like a just take children and do whatever. I mean, I'm a very, honestly, I mean, I do my best. I'm very quality conscious. I really want the things that we say we do, we must do. So, you know, so I think, but on the at the same time, parents should come and see what we do. Like we're part of science from scientists. We're part of WPI. We're part of Leader in Me program. So we do a lot of, you know, extracurricular activity to make sure that we fulfill that sort of the enrichment pieces. And you have seen it. You've visited the school. You've seen, you know, the things that we're trying to do and develop our staff. Uh, yes, I think if someone has a specific need, a uh, special, uh, you know, some sort of a special educational need type of stuff, we may not as equipped in it, but I think, uh, honestly, I can tell you a lot of people I have have come visited us from public school sector, uh, whether it's a public, a public school system, they came in, they actually visited our school. They said, you know, you guys are doing an amazing job. And that is hearing from outside. That's awesome, mashallah. No, that's awesome. Well, I, I I don't think like that. Please don't don't <laughs> don't shoot a WhatsApp message after this program is done. Otherwise, I won't have sent my daughter goes to Alhamra, my son goes to Al uh, Al Huda, and I don't know about where Maryam will go. Maybe Darul Arkham. I don't know. <laughs> but but um, uh, on on a serious note, this this mashallah uh, uh, eradicate many misunderstandings. This is small response from both of you. Now, Sister Hassa. Uh, first of all, Jazakallah khairan for waiting. So now, uh, should I repeat my question? Yes, please. But before you do that, I just want to speak to what Brother Nadim and Sister Noor said. And, you know, professional development is something that we do in every career, in every domain, in every field. Um, if we weren't doing it, then then how would we grow as humans? So, you know, that's something that, that in public schools we're constantly working on. How do we make this better? How do we engage kids in a way that's meaningful for them? So, you know, I don't think that that is a um, shortcoming. I think that's a that's a great thought process to always be improving ourselves and improving our systems. Okay, That's now great. you can ask your question again. <laughs> yeah, no, so now coming back, sister and uh, Hafsa, I, uh, I will ask you then, I will ask another loaded question to the round. So uh, the question which I had uh, for you is that, uh, assuming kids are not coming to Islamic school, you have, are the best person in the panelists to answer being a mother of a home school, teacher in Islamic school for such a long time, uh, public school for such a long time. Should this select public school or should this select home school? And what are the uh, benefits and where they have to compensate? So, you know, homeschooling, I think, is is definitely an option for people, but it takes a lot more planning on the side of an adult, on the side of a parent or, or, or a caretaker. Um, you have to, you know, you have to teach curriculum. It's not, you know, playtime all the time. Um, and there are protocols that are in place from the state. Your child has to go in and kind of show that they've learned what they've learned. Um, that being said, as Sister Noor had alluded to earlier, that um, you, when you homeschool, you really can tailor the education to the needs of the child in front of you. And, you know, even if you have four kids like I do, it's much more manageable than when you have 28 in front of you. So um, that is some, definitely something to be said, but it does take coordination. It takes, you know, a level of education from the parent, a level of desire to research options and supplements, just like Sister Nora also mentioned, you know, extracurricular activities, you know, maybe a homeschooling pod, something where you're giving them a little bit more, perhaps um, that's something that's not a strength of your own, you find someone else that has a strength. For instance, you know, in biology, maybe you're not great about it, but you will find that resource. So it does take a lot more coordination on that part. And I think as they get older, the academic demands become harder. So it really comes down to, um, as a parent, are you equipped to do that? Or are you equipped to find the resources um, to do that? But the idea of, of doing that, you know, you're not going to be compensating for morality because you are always going to be yourself and your morals and your beliefs and your, you know, uh, faith in Allah is, is constant and your child sees that in you. Um, in public school, it's a little bit different and it really does change, you know, from day to day, year to year, 
uh, school to school. So that is something that, you know, we have when they come home, like Sister Noor said and, and Brother Nadine said, you know, we have to show them that respect. We have to show them that love. We have to give them that space, you know, maybe um, like a mini halakha at home. That's something that's a family thing where you're coming together and you're spending time talking about things that are important. You know, maybe you read Salah together. Maybe you discuss an eye of the Quran. There's so many ways. Maybe you take a nature walk, you know, and say, oh, wow, subhanAllah, look at that tree. Look what Allah created, right? Giving them those you know, Allah's everywhere. He's not just, you know, in this book, in this moment, you know, we don't have to be like, you know, one more study. It can be, I'm taking a walk. I'm seeing this tree. SubhanAllah, look at how Allah, how, how Allah created the tree. Look at the colors that they're changing. And, you know, look at how Allah designed it and kind of build that conversation in along with that science and that, and that attachment to your child. So if you have that attachment to your child and you're showing the attachment to Allah, that is a way to kind of bring them back because it is, you know, I grew up here and yes, there is a, there is a pressure to either defend yourself or to hide yourself. Those are pretty much what it is right now. Uh, I'm thinking it's much worse now than it was even when I was a child. So those are things that you have to then give them, you know, re refill their bucket as we say, so that they have more to give the next day. Beautiful, mashallah. Jazakumullah khairan to all of your responses. And before I can move forward with some of the, loaded questions. Um, I just wanted to say sincerely uh, thanks and jazakumullah khairan because I know that I'm Imam, I'm in a public service job and you as a teacher also or principal also, you are in kind of a public service job whether uh, dealing with the kids, dealing with the students, dealing with the parents and staff and management and then board and all those things. Um, so just want to say sincere thanks that you all are delivering beautiful way and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you staqama consistency and sincerity inshallah. Um, now I have one question in front of me, one question as an imam and then a few questions which I have seen many questions came. Uh, Dr. Khalid Abdul Qadir says mashallah it takes a village to raise the entire community and we'll talk about that inshallah but just let me ask you uh, two questions and then we'll go to the uh, audience inshallah. So the, uh, you spoke about um, Actually, one of the comments also came about that, uh, Brother Adnan Malik. Uh, Munib, if you can show that uh, in the comment section. So the question came, um, let me go and check that. Yes, so Adnan Malik asks, no Islamic schools are offered at the, uh, no Islamic schools are offered at the high school level when children are challenged the most with teenage hormones, peer pressure, and need that feeling of acceptances. And um, my daughter is in fourth grade. Uh, wallahi, I'm worried for her that both Al Huda and Al Hamra are doing amazing job, but until eighth grade. So, do you guys have any plan? Uh, I know that means you. Um, there are many dynamics involved to this question, but um, is there any discussion about? Uh, uh, is it lack of need, lack of resource? Why is that when students need the uh, Islam most in their high school? We'll throw them from the uh, Islamic school to the public school. Um, so, how would you how would you answer that? And let's start with Sister Noor, inshallah. Um, children always need Islam most. Um, so, I, I think every age has its own, um, uh, you know, needs and requirements, and 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 you deliver faith differently at a different age appropriate grade appropriate level so i think the need is always there um i definitely do agree that um a teenager has a, a brain that's wired uh, very differently at that age and uh, you know has other requirements that need to be met at that time as well um so yeah i get it there is totally a need for a muslim high school in the area and the one that we have over here um, is doing a fantastic job but unfortunately is a hike um so you know it, it you know it is a commute it does take around 40 minutes to get there we have had students um you know in the past who have um you know, done the drive and, you know, taking their kids there. And then Alhamdulillah in, in, in the last years of high school, um, you know, they are able to tie them to the community college um, that the student is a resident in, and then they can take um, some courses there. So, you know, that kind of reduces that commute aspect a little bit in the last two years in particular. Having said that, um, does Al Hamra have plans of opening a high school? The, the conversation is always on the table. Um, but um, I will not do something that I am not 100% confident that I can deliver well. Um, and you do require, it, it's 
cannot be an experiment. Uh, and that I am a firm believer in. Um, it cannot be an experimental process where we use three families and, you know, try teachers who've taught middle school or try teachers who have done X, Y, Z and plug in and, oh, you know what, you, you like to cook, let's offer a cooking course uh, as an elective or something like that. So it has to be really well thought out. It cannot be an experimental thing when um, the learning of, these children is at you know is is the center of it all, um, and I think yes, definitely it requires um, resources, it requires planning, it requires space, it requires all of those things, and I think this is actually an excellent excellent opportunity for the community to come together, and I think that if we were able to um, you know uh, have a conversation separately. Uh, rather than as an extension conversation to elementary and middle schools that already exist. I think the community will be able to come together uh, if we have a conversation about the high school project, you know, um, and everybody coming together with their expertise and their ideas and their resources to really make this happen in, in, the, in the greater Worcester County. I think it's a fabulous idea. The need is definitely there. Um, every year I have several several parents who say but what's next you know <laughs> um, and of course the second part of that is how are we preparing our kids for public high school which is a conversation for another day or maybe today later but you know yeah that's a separate topic but I think the need for the high school um, does not go away that's great uh, brother Nadine before I'll come to you uh, sister Noor she can I ask you one counter question yeah go ahead so you said it cannot be experimental right yes Depends on how you're reading me, uh, but go ahead. No, I, I don't know. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, most of the Islamic schools came into existence with experimental method. I'm not saying Al Huda Al Hamra, but I, as an Imam, have traveled a lot nationally, and every uncle of the Mazid, every uncle at the school, they would say I was the alone only brother in this community, and their three brothers already told me in that community that I was the only brother in this community. And then they would take me to the tour and we had only two families or five families we started and then eventually we got this beautiful big building islamic school mm -hmm. like that and i don't even know that um and then they are well established so uh, aren't we saying that perfection is an enemy of good that just is I'm, I'm not going to undervalue the work of the founding uh men and women of Muslim schools across North America. Um, definitely for someone to start the project in town, cities, wherever, uh, required a lot of courage, required a lot of trust, and required a lot of experimentation. And yes, a lot of Muslim schools across North America did start in the basements of Masajid or uh, you know, two rooms in a strip mall or something like that. Um, and I think that they met the needs at the time really well. Um, you know, that, that that was a different generation, though. Uh, we did have different stakes uh, in the ground at that time, right? And now, uh, after, let's say, 30 years beyond that time, uh, Muslim schools, by and large in North America, have had to do a vision shift, right? Where we've decided that, okay, uh, we did a great job starting, uh, we did excellent work preserving the identity with the means that were there. And now what do we do to debunk the myths that now exist about Muslim schools based on that 30 year history, right? So a lot of the questions that you asked earlier had to do with the debunking of those very things that, you know, people kind of reached these conclusions over 30 years about them. Right now in this, in 2020, um, the high school, it cannot be an experiment. It, I mean, it. I would not do it as an experimental study. Um, I would really put a lot of thought uh, into delivering this right because we do not want to end up with, uh, you know, something ad hoc that is not well researched. Now, Jazak Lohar and Sister Noor, and I hope I didn't offend you with my question, right? Not at all. No, 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 not okay. at all. Just okay, uh, Brother Nadim. Inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, just, uh, I'll quickly um, say what Ms. Sister Noor has said, actually, but I'll just put my flavor to it. Um, you know, um, I think uh, you really have to look at uh, uh, as in as in middle school or elementary school where you're focusing the quality of education. So when your children are leaving, for example, the middle school, 
are they preparing for are they prepared for algebra one are they prepared for bio are they so what what, what we have experienced is that they are really well equipped in terms of managing high school courses when they move into that as far as us as al huda we had a, a presentation uh, done by our middle school team to see how do we want to move forward because obviously every time we have a large group of graduates leaving parents ask what do we do next it's a similar question so the closest option is a hike as sister noor has alluded so i think there is definitely a need i really think yep. but i also wanted to say that this is more of a uh, you know this is this is a very well versed well thought out and methodical process where you want to make sure that you're moving with your your you, even if you're experimenting it you you know what you're doing um and and with that i think there's a higher management for example all these centers need to come together you know she mentioned that you know you you need to bring the best minds together to make sure if you wanting to move into this direction it has to be you know it has to be really goal oriented uh moving forward thinking we're going to establish it and and again i wanted to uh, point out something that um you know and obviously um as an imam your role is very critical too uh, and i wanted to share that experience because sometimes we we have i have personally experienced that imam goes left and 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 the school goes right and the imam goes right and the school goes left which means that you know there is no coordination of spiritual leader of the community and the 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 school leadership uh and the management so i think that needs to really be because i think at the end of the day this is one community uh, laying these bricks for future generations because i think we're going to leave one day and i always ask myself what am i leaving behind because i'm not here for 500 years you know it, so we have a very short period of time and want to make sure what we're leaving behind is going to be left behind as a legacy for people to remember us not for our name sake but something that would benefit in the hereafter jazakallahu uh, khairan dr nadim and dr noor uh, sister hafsa in 60 seconds i don't have even more than 60 seconds don't worry um i think that the process is much more in um cumbersome than people realize you know you want to be accredited you want to make sure your kids can get into college and so in order to have accreditation at the high school the last time i looked into it you have to have people that are licensed in that subject area as well as secondary education so to teach science you have to be secondary ed and have you know a degree in science for math the same so to have just that level of quality of teacher and and people with the accreditation requirements that i think that's been the hold up for as long as i've been in I, I, I completely in disagree community. why don't they all become but why don't is, they all become imam where you have to teach all the subjects where you have to teach the adults <laughs> and the kids where you have to do the outreach work where you have to do the dawa work where you have to lead the all the salah and then people will ask you what imam is doing anyway just just, just make all of them imam <laughs> anyway don't see this note But, um, no, but seriously one. though, the accreditation requirements are pretty stringent. Um, I, I'm thinking, especially in Massachusetts, I would assume, but um, I'm not sure about other states. But that is really what has been the holdup for all of these years, as far as I can tell. Inshallah, may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala help this community. One of the question came before I can ask you the Imam question. We have only eight minutes remaining. We might go two, three minutes up, Inshallah, today. Um, one question came from someone, and all the people agreed to it. and that's a loaded question i know uh, that there are a lot of dynamics attached to it it's high time uh, actually before that uh, so the quest uh, comment came that i think we should co- cooperate and combine the resources of alamara and alhuda and this will enable us to build a high school uh, and then uh, a lot of people like dr khalid abdul qadir and sister marla they said yes we agree we agree uh, i know um, this will require more discussion within our team because when you you are representative of the entire team uh, of alhuda and entire community alhamra and entire community but what do you think about that or for an high school project i think it's a beautiful idea um but i think that neither alhuda and nor uh, uh, alhamra um have expertise uh for a high school so it you know it would be um it would be and i mean it would be a great exercise in cooperation um but uh, which which i'm all for absolutely i always refer to alhuda as our sister school um but i think that neither of these schools have uh, explored high school or have um you know the necessary legwork uh, going on to to make that happen um 
like I said earlier, I think the community definitely should come together and uh, push this idea forward. That's great. Uh, Dr. Nadim, in 32 seconds. 32 seconds. First correction. I am no sister school. I'm a brother school. So <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just I'm just joking. I don't mean that. Uh, but um, yeah. but okay, brother. <laughs> but Sister Noor had said, I think uh, I'm in. I'm 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 for it. Actually, you know, these communities need to come together and really think about the future of our future generations and the high school students and whatnot. Uh, because at the end of the day, I, I said this before and I'll say it again, you know, it's not about uh, individuals, it's about system thinking. What are you leaving behind as a system that even if you leave, you're leaving a system that actually you reap the benefit in the hereafter. I think that's very, very critical. So inshallah, Al Huda Academy with its leadership, uh, at least myself, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm my my dissertation was uh, high school perception in towards higher education and student readiness is all about how well the high school students are ready in public school systems and how well are they doing in colleges. So, you know, I have a small um, area where I have done my literature review and all that. So I think when that discussion opens up, I would like to really chip in. Sister Hausa, you know how much time you have, right? One second. I'm the only one that didn't write a dissertation. I feel really, really I mean, you like, like I, I'm a slacker. <laughs> I feel like I'm a slacker. <laughs> You're gonna have to repeat the question. I lost it again. <laughs> so the, uh, this is what happens on a Friday night, brother. <laughs> the question was that um, uh, Al Huda and Al Hamra should cooperate and combine for high school, and um, then. Um, Add this uh, element that someone, uh, Brother Nasser, have added that if that's not possible, then at least focus on one should focus on elementary and middle, and the other should focus on high school. So I'll take elementary and middle. Of the <laughs> I think one should take elementary, the other should take middle and high. But then you're talking about you know transportation issues and things like that. But anyway, I I mean I think that's a fantastic idea. But I think more so instead of putting the burden on the systems that already exist, you have to bring in more resources. You know, we have the same 2% of people doing the volunteer work, the same 2% running the Islamic schools, the same 2% running our masjids. Dude, where's everybody else? People need to come. If they want to make it happen, then they need to help with the legwork. And I know I sound a little assertive, but the reality is if we want to make things happen, more people have to step up. We have a very large community. I don't think we even have 2% participation. I think we've inspired Imam Asif to uh, begin the high school project. I, I, I would have you. loved it. Hello? Like... Hello? <laughs> <laughs> Is your okay, mic stop working? Just... <laughs> Just we have three minutes. I'll add two more minutes. Um, but I think the reality is we, yeah. know, we need people to put in the legwork and it needs to be fresh blood. Like it needs to be new people with energy and with time that are not already strapped extremely thin. And to even bring that conversation right now, it's on poor brother Nadim and on sister Roar and honestly on myself when we are in this pandemic and trying to do 70,000 things simultaneously. I, I kid you not. This is probably the hardest thing you can put on my plate right now. <laughs> so no, thank you. Not for me. <laughs> no, may Allah make it easy for all of you. I know you all are doing amazing uh, work and may Allah SWT reward all of you for your hard work. Well, like, this is, uh, you won't get compliment from the community as much as you deserve, but uh, your compliments, your reward is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah. Mm -hmm. Um, so now, um, there are so many things, but just last question. And we have only one minute for each panelists and then we will end inshallah by the way we had a very healthy discussion would you mind joining us again maybe for our future friday night halakha to continue our conversation you don't ask life <laughs> after the school year is over <laughs> i'm out you can ask us offline <laughs> okay i think we are still live uh, okay so now my, my oh, question no. <laughs> uh by the way everyone liked the discussion uh, so I will use my imam power to say, no, you have to join inshallah next time. Okay, quickly. Um, so we as an imam in our imam WhatsApp groups and imam councils, um, especially in the last few years, um, because of whatever reason we are discussing this, that um, um, the ideological challenge which um, uh, our Muslim youth will going to face in this country in next decade or two, uh, it will be huge and humongous, uh, especially uh, with the attack uh, of um, all these isms, uh, modern day isms. And then you have uh, uh, 
basically how to deal with different challenges, whether it's academic challenge like evolution or what should be a practicing Muslim stand on different issues, social issues or, or, or different issues. Um, so and when I spoke to uh, some of the, or when I see some of the teachers, some of the teachers like yourself, mashallah, you were principal in your teachers, Sarsa, you are qualified to answer that. Um, but not all the teacher of Islamic school, I'm not focusing on Al-Hudan and Hamra right now, and I'm talking about nationally, are trained ideologically. You are taking courses of self-development and academic, but who are you connected uh, to your, I know both of you are connected to me as a local imam, but what about your religious upbringing um, where these new challenges and these new tackle, the spiritual issues can be tackled. And whenever your, your students will ask you the question, you won't give a, a random answer which a Desi auntie gave 20 years ago. So the example I'm saying when we had the discussion in Imam conferences, um, the, um, the, the, the students who are going to give the stereotypical answer, which is not authentic, which is not traditional, is most of the time coming from Islamic school. And when you ask them, they would say, well, we have learned from our teacher, we have learned from our brother. Uh, and this is not once or twice, this happens um, every single time. Again, again, I'm not talking about schools in Massachusetts. So do you have any plan of how to tackling this um, social but spiritual issues um, and ideological challenges? Just one minute to each panelist, inshallah. You ask a question that took a long, longer than a minute to ask, and the answer is supposed to be one minute. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. You can, take, you can take one minute and two seconds. That's all right. That's all right. Um, there is a lot of mindful uh, um, planning and deliberation that goes into crafting a curriculum that will equip Muslim students for the social environment that they're living in. Because if you just left it to a boxed curriculum of English language, art, science, math, and si social studies, it will not address those issues. We know for a fact that mainstream curriculum does not really delve into issues of equity or racial justice for that matter. Um, and we're bringing to this a whole other dimension of conversations around marginalization, conversations in, around discrimination, identity, spiritual strength, and the gamut that everything in between, right? Um, so yeah, in our curriculum, we really have to mindfully plug these things in and open these conversations, these difficult conversations that many times Muslim parents find taboo or difficult to have at home. Like, how do I talk to my kid about um, gender interaction? Or how do I talk to my kid about vaping or substance abuse or um, everything in between, right? So uh, we as Muslim schools then take on the responsibility upon ourselves to engage in these conversations that families are having a hard time having and then hold parent workshops, enable parents to have these conversations. Let's talk to you about vaping, you know, or um, how do you engage in a conversation around vaping with your child, for instance. And then in eighth grade in particular at Alhamra, um, our capstone is always based around projects of social awareness and social justice. That's a huge theme. That's a pet peeve for myself and for the work we do as Muslims. I mean, what are we if we're not caretakers of this planet, right? Uh, and, and each other. Um, so a lot of work around that and uh, putting our students actually in mock situations where we ask them the tough questions that they will be asked at some point in their lives. Uh, and then, you know, work around what the responses can look like. Um, and, you know, what we come across as when we give a response that, that says uh, this or that or whatever. Um, so I think there's just a lot of mindful work that happens around um, faith and, um, in, in my case, racial justice and inequity um, and um, identity as well. Jazakallah Khairan, Sister Noor. Yes, uh, Dr. Nadim. Only sixty seconds. Remember. Inshallah, um, sixty seconds. So, um, I'll just. Uh, I think uh, it's a similar situation with us. Uh, we have the department head who I always ask anyone. See, we have a rule in the school that if if someone has any uh, religion. <laughs> 
question he should ask the, the department head or or the circle that actually teaches teaches Islamic studies and whatnot. Uh, as to your point is, uh, where do our students stand when it comes to, you know, a little bit of a critical thinking, the discussions where, uh, and I can tell you uh, in, in, in 15 seconds, I have a professor in Yale, Yale University who tells you at the beginning of the semester that if you believe in the hereafter, that if you believe in the life in the grave, because if you do, after my class, there will be no such thing. So when you <laughs> in class, be ready that he will actually neutralize you. So I think that it's because I attended his class and it's a really intense because there are so many. And I think our children need to be, as to your point, they need to be prepared for those higher end discussions. I mean, because it's not really like the, the ritual discussion of, oh, we do this because I learned this or we do this because I done this. No, this is, I think this, this, this stage has, has been over. The time has changed. We need to move into higher order thinking skills and we need to bring these young people to a discussion table where they openly discuss discuss open question where they're facing these challenges but they're not asking you these questions and the reason i say this only, the only reason i'm saying this is because i ask these questions to the university students and and you know their questions are, are genuinely coming from what they have been learning around them because there's no foundational work being done no beautiful brother, brother nadim you believe in akhara right you know, uh, I, I, last time I checked, I think I do. I still do. <laughs> okay, because you took that class from that professor, right? So I'm just yeah. checking. Yeah. Just like <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, Sister Hafsa, final comments, 59 seconds. Why do I always get these? Because I was giving them six. There. You should have changed because rotations every other question. I was giving them seconds they took more, so I thought you would get less. No, I, I, I'm always very concise, alhamdulillah. Right. I think you've noticed that. Um, so instead of teaching kids what to think, we need to teach them how to think. Being critical. You know, what's your source? How do you know it's a reliable source? Where are you getting your information from? And, and, and in this life where, you know, the internet, anybody can post anything and make it look like a, it's a legitimate website or it's a legitimate source. We have to teach kids how to process all of this and how to gather that information, especially in the upper elementary and middle school, but you can start very young too. What's your, you know, what's your uh, claim? What's your evidence? We can do that from books. How does the character feel? You know, how do you know the character feels this way? That's critical thinking for a child that's, you know, six or seven. Um, but you can take that into the older grades and bring in these big topics and have them look for the sources, have them research a little bit, have them have those conversations like the other two mentioned, have them look to see, you know, what is their critical analysis of it? And then going to the actual source, what's your evidence and how reliable is your evidence? And so if we teach kids how to think and how to think critically, inshallah, they're gonna be okay. But if we kind of just give them, this is the answer because I told you, so what happens when you're gone? Who's gonna tell themselves? So? Yes, yes. Very true. So, Jazakumullah khairan to all of you for giving your precious time. I know you all are busy and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all of you. And I hope that inshallah we'll have this conversation part two soon inshallah. I'll talk to you after this live thing is done inshallah, no worries. Uh, but again, uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for whatever being said wrongly inshallah and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward us for giving our time inshallah. And inshallah, I will see you soon. Jazakumullah khairan who joined us live inshallah. I will see you next Friday. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum.